Hey, I'm excited about today. I've been waiting on this message as part of this series that, that we had, the Unto Us series that we've been in. And week one, if you weren't here with us, we talked about giving. And we looked at that from a biblical perspective and how it really is an opportunity to ensure that we are being fully blessed by God. And sometimes we look at it and we're like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to give. Let me tell you something. If you're not giving, you're missing out on an opportunity. It isn't about us as this church padding our pockets or having more in the bank account. It's about your life being full of the promises of God and seeing them fulfilled. We talked about disappointments and how that's a great opportunity to do three things when we have disappointments in our life. It's a great opportunity to worship. It's a great opportunity to trust, and it's a great opportunity to encourage other people. People find great encouragement in knowing that you have faced a struggle that they're facing. They connect with that. They understand that. We talked about how God has a place for each and every one of us. And last week, we talked about how we have to forsake the ordinary. We've got to break the routine to ensure that we never miss the moments that are all around us, that are happening each and every day. There's opportunities to seize. But man, I'm number one. I hate breaking that routine. I hate jumping out of it. But we've got to own the moment so that we don't miss the moment. We've got to be willing to step out of that routine and experience the fullness of life. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It's what we've built this from. It says, for, a, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I love this prophecy. We've talked about it all throughout the series about how we're some 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And there are all of these prophecies. The truth is the entire Bible is about Jesus. The whole thing, it's not just the New Testament. Cover to cover is about Jesus. It's about the coming of Jesus. It's about his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his return. The whole thing is about Jesus. But I love this because it looks to me a lot like a checklist. I remember being in undergraduate school, and I think it was second, third year of undergraduate school kind of in there, and one of our teachers made us do kind of the cliche thing of, I want you to write down what you hope you will have accomplished or what you believe you will have accomplished 10 years from now. I'm roughly 20 when I'm doing this. I'm 20. I don't know my head from my rear end, okay? But I remember writing it down and I wrote down that I was gonna own my own business. Check. I wrote down that I would have a family by then. Check. It's a questionable one. Got a family of monsters, but they're all there. And then I remember writing something down that I look back on and I think, I just didn't get it. I didn't understand it. Had to do with money. How much money I believed I was going to make at 30. To me, that was a great achievement at the time. That, that was going to solidify my place in society. It was going to give me some standing and some power. It was a lofty goal. Check. I hit it. And I looked up at 30, and I looked around me, and I looked at all of the blessings that I had, and I looked at everything that God had done in my life, And I thought back to that moment when I'm 20 and I'm sitting in a classroom that I don't even want to be in that I surely considered skipping because I was going to maximize every absence I could ever be given all throughout college. If you went every day, you're a fool, all right? I got the same degree as you. (laughs) But I think back. And at that point in time in my life, one of the greatest struggles that I was experiencing was an identity issue as it related to how I saw Jesus. At that point in my life, I was consumed with the idea that Jesus' job, the job of Jesus was to ensure that I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish in my life. I was Santa and he was the elf. 
And I started checking off all of the things that I thought were going to make me happy. That I thought were going to bring fulfillment. That I thought were going to answer the big questions of my life. And I realized I wasn't seeing Jesus for the real Jesus. I didn't see him for who he truly was. Because if I saw him as the real Jesus, the benevolent father that stepped down from heaven and became man, that walked this earth, that experienced great tragedy and sorrow and disappointment and frustration and temptation, that then was mocked and ridiculed and hung on a cross like a piece of meat to die. If I saw that Jesus then I would understand that it wasn't Jesus' job to help me accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. It was my job to help Jesus accomplish his purpose. I had my roles reversed. I didn't see Jesus for who he truly was. I thought Jesus was my helper. I missed that I was really his. And I think oftentimes in life we struggle with this concept of where we see Jesus and how we see Jesus and what our role is in all of it and how we're supposed to accomplish it because we don't see the real Jesus. We see a, a painting, right, of a Scandinavian man with long hair and blue eyes and perfect teeth like they had braces then and a bright smile And he's always wearing like a flowing gown that's like clean and neatly pressed. And he's and he's in sandals. And and we think that Christmas is Jesus. Newsflash, Jesus wasn't even born on December 25th. Like, and he wasn't Scandinavian. And odds are he didn't have blue eyes or blonde hair. We don't see Jesus for who he really is. Because the portrait that we all see of Jesus is this portrait of what we would imagine perfection to be. But Jesus, as we learn through studying the life, death, resurrection, and ascension, wasn't concerned. Jesus wasn't concerned with the external. He was concerned with the internal. And it poses one of these great challenges for all of the people of this time whenever Jesus is born because they're looking at it and saying he has a checklist. See, the government's going to be on his shoulders. He's going to be the next king. That's what it is. He's going to take King Herod's spot. He's going to be the next king. That's what he's supposed to do. We started putting Jesus in a box the day he was born. The day he was born... The Jewish folks at the time started saying, okay, when when is he going to become the next king? If he really is Jesus, then he has to rule the government. And what they missed then, just as we miss now, is Jesus isn't concerned with the external. He's not concerned with the earthly. He's concerned with the internal, which is the heavenly. We have to begin to understand who he truly is and see him for what he really is. Our problem is that our mind's pictures of Jesus often doesn't match who he actually is. And because we don't see who he actually is, we don't see him at all. If we don't see the real Jesus, then what are we really seeing? What are we really experiencing? What are we really going through? What are we really appreciating? One of the great challenges of that, though, is that just as the people at the time of Jesus' birth were viewing this prophecy and saying, hey, there's a checklist of things that he has to do to really be Jesus. And they determined what the checklist really was. They didn't understand that he was operating in a higher dimension, that he was operating on his own time and his own calling. They had a preview, but they didn't experience the real movie. They didn't experience the whole story, the whole truth. A few weeks back, I snuck out and took Collier to see Ralph Breaks the Internet. Wreck-It Ralph 2, as he would call it. And we're sitting in this movie, and we're about three-quarters of the way through, and you can tell he's starting to get a little bit antsy, and I'm not sure why, because he's a pretty good movie watcher. So I said, hey, what's up? And he said, well, on the preview, there's this really funny part, but I keep waiting for it, and it's not happening. I said, well, maybe it's to come. I don't know. And we leave, and I don't know what the preview was because I didn't see the preview, and his explanation of the preview came in about 8 million words, none of which made sense. But we leave the movie, and he's in total disappointment because he came for the scene in the preview that really made him laugh, 
and never saw it in the actual movie. Maybe it happened and he missed it. Maybe it didn't happen. I don't know. But so often in our lives, we have a preview. We have a preview. We've got a preset expectation of what we're going into when we meet Jesus. I saw the preview, so the whole movie's going to match the preview, right? It's not... It's, it's all going to be funny like the preview was funny. All, every part of it, the beginning, the middle, the end, every ounce of it. And then we get into this real story of Jesus and we're like, I don't know, man, this is kind of disappointing. It's kind of not working out the way that I thought it was going to. It's tough. I didn't think it was going to be hard. I thought it was going to be easy. You mean... I pray and ask for something, and sometimes I have to wait for it? That wasn't in the preview. Give me the 90-second version of Jesus. I don't need the two-hour version. I need that insta-Jesus, the stuff that just pops up, right? It's readily available all the time, and we get in, and we experience it, and we're like, but the preview doesn't always match, and then we become disappointed, and I believe that There are oftentimes when we become disappointed with Jesus, what we do is we separate and we pull back and we retract. If you don't hear anything else today, hear this. When your life is full of disappointment, that's the time you should press in harder than you've ever pressed in. It's not the time to retract from Jesus and say, the movie's not matching the preview. It's the time to pursue him like you've never pursued him before. It's the time to worship him like you've never worshiped him before. It's the time to serve like you've never served before. It's the time to give like you've never given before. You, you know what I, you know how, this is, I'm not tooting my horn here. I just, I just want to share. You know how I've gotten out of every financial difficulty that Chris and I have ever been in? I've given my way out. You go, oh, that doesn't make sense. Uh-uh, it doesn't. There are lots of things about Jesus that don't make sense. And I've told y'all this before, but it's the truest statement ever. If I understood everything about Jesus, I'd be Jesus. I don't want to be Jesus. Some things about it we just can't explain. It's just him. He's God. He created us. We don't understand everything about the guy that created us. But we want to see him clearly. In the moments of our disappointments, if we will press and not retract, if we'll pursue and not run, if we'll serve and not bail out, if we'll give and not hold on to what we already have, we'll see the real Jesus. He'll begin to reveal himself to us like he never has before. We'll begin to see him differently than we ever have before. We'll begin to understand because here's the reality. At the time that Jesus is born, there's a large group of people that are saying, no, you can't really be the Messiah. You're not really fulfilling our needs. You're not really who you say you are. They wanted external peace. They wanted Jesus to defeat all of their actual physical enemies, and Jesus was worried about internal peace. They wanted external salvation, but he wasn't there to bring external salvation. He was there to bring internal salvation. They wanted a guy that was going to sit on an earthly throne and be the king of kings of that day. And he said, no, 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 you see, I'm not here for a moment. I'm here for ever for eternity it isn't an earthly throne that I'm taking it's a heavenly throne that I step down from that's still rightfully mine and while I'm here walking this earth and performing miracles among you and doing all of the things that I have to do and suffering and experiencing so that I can have a proper relationship with you so that I can see your struggles and your trials and your frustrations so that I can experience what you will inevitably experience sons and daughters I'm still sitting on my throne. I'm still ruling the governments. I'm still in control. So often in my life, I want the external Jesus, not the internal Jesus. I want to own my own business. I want to have a family. Nothing wrong with that one. I want to make X amount of money. I think, what if at 20... What moment did I miss? What if at 20, it had been, I want to introduce 500 plus people to the real Jesus in the next 10 years. I want to give X number of dollars to the kingdom. I want to sponsor 
this many children in need. How different would my life's accomplishments be as I stand before you today if I hadn't missed the moment? If I had seen Jesus for who he truly is, if I had understood that it's not his job to help me accomplish what I want to accomplish, but it's my job to help him accomplish his purpose on earth. And here's the beautiful thing about our Jesus. Man, when you're sold out and you're pursuing him and you're serving him and you're giving to him, what he does is he takes care of all of it. Because you have internal peace that the external can't shake. You have internal salvation and the foundation of knowing that you will sit in heaven at the right hand of the Father and experience perfection for yourself. He changes the internal so that the external can no longer defeat you. If all he did was defeat the enemy of the Jews of that day, another enemy would just come. But if I give you internal peace, it will last through all of the trials and all of the tribulations and all of the enemies and all of the heartbreak and all of the disappointment of this earth so that you can see just a little bit of heaven. Jesus descends and unto us a child is born so that we can see the glory of heaven manifest on this earth so that we can fully experience him. Luke chapter 24. Verses 13 through 23. Give you a little context here. Jesus has been crucified. He's been put in the grave. The ladies have shown up at the grave and they've looked and there's no body in there. The stone's been rolled away and he's not there. The world is in heartbreak. Those that believe that Jesus was in fact the Messiah are hopeless. They don't know what to do, where to turn. They put all their eggs in one basket and they're saying, I don't have a basket anymore. I don't know what to do. It says, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven, seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? I love that. He knows. He asked anyway. It's called a good relationship. He cares enough to ask. He cares enough to listen, not just tell us. He wants us to discover freedom for ourselves because it's only when we discover it for ourselves that we fully experience it. He can tell us about all of the great things in the world, but if we don't experience them for ourselves, we never fully recognize them. We never see the real Jesus. So they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? you the only one, Jesus. you the only fool. you the only loser walking along these seven miles that doesn't have a clue that Jesus isn't really Jesus, that he's not really who he said he was. What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen visions of angels who said he was alive. At this point in time, I can only imagine being Cleo and the other guy who wasn't important enough to get his name written in the Bible. <laughs> Walking along seven miles, downtrodden, saying, hey man, we thought Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. We thought he was going to redeem Israel. But they crucified him. They handed him over to be sentenced. They hung him on the tree. He did, in fact, die. They put him in a tomb, and now we don't even know where he is. Can you imagine the heartbreak? You saw the real Jesus. You were following the real Jesus. And now he's not there to be seen. He's not there to be touched. He's not there to be heard. He's not there to be felt. He's not there to be in relationship with. 
And I love that Jesus just continues walking along for seven miles with these guys and having conversation with them, knowing the answer to every question that they ask, knowing that they are misguided, that they don't fully understand, knowing that at any point in time he could reveal himself as Jesus to them, that he could show them, hey, I really am alive. The difficulty is that these guys are literally walking with the real Jesus and don't see him. How do you see the real Jesus? How do I see the real Jesus if these guys can walk seven miles beside him and not understand that it's him, not understand that he's the one, not understand that he's there with a purpose? I think about it and I go back It says they stood still, their faces downcast. Did they ever look up? Scripture doesn't tell us. I know when I'm down, when my face is down, and someone walks up and maybe they begin a conversation with me. I don't want to look them in the eye. I don't want to see them for who they really are. I just want to continue my journey and continue my path. I just want to keep looking down. My face is down. I don't want to make eye contact. I don't want to be in that kind of relationship. You don't understand the struggles that I'm going through. You don't understand the disappointment. You don't understand the hope that I've lost. I'm just headed back home seven miles. I don't know who you are, guy. But listen, man, do you not know everything that's happening? I mean, seriously, there's no reason to be chipper. Would you please get out of here? We got things to do. We got to get back to work. We got to go pray to God and say, when are you really going to send the Savior, the Messiah? How are we really going to know? Because we thought this was the guy. And apparently it wasn't. So apparently we're never going to be able to discern. So I don't even know that I'm going to follow the next guy that I believe to be the Messiah because I was wrong this time. And I can just imagine Cleo and his buddy walking along and never looking up. They never lifted their head. They never looked up to see the real Jesus. And so often in life, we walk with our heads down. Maybe not literally, but figuratively we do. We say, ah, Jesus isn't really here for me. I'm disappointed in the work that Jesus has been doing. Jesus hasn't been helping me accomplish everything that I want to accomplish. Jesus isn't working through the checklist for me. Jesus isn't actually sitting on King Herod's throne where he's supposed to be sitting. It's not the real Jesus. And all he's saying is, Would you just look up? Would you just look up? Listen, we don't look down as believers. The devil's under our feet. We don't look down. We look up. We don't look down. We've defeated down. He already stole the keys to hell and to death. He's already taken care of the down. I can just imagine me and Jesus saying, boys. And Jesus is patient. Seven miles, and he never corrects them. Seven miles, and he's not like, Cleo, come on, son. Get with it. Don't you know that it's really me? Listen, if you're in the midst of struggle or disappointment or frustration with where you are in life, if you need something from God and you feel like he's not delivering, look up. Look up, because you can never see the real Jesus looking down. You can never see the real Jesus when your face is downcast, when you're looking at your feet walking along and you're saying, I'm just not sure where I'm going. I'm not sure what the next step is. He's saying, if you'll look up, I'll give you the direction. If you'll look up, I'll give you the next step. If you'll look up, I'll give you the next strength. If you'll look up, you can see me. You can see the real Jesus. Man, when we worship, we look up. We look up to the Father. We lift our hands to heaven and say, meet me here and Now, number two, your disappointment doesn't mean that the God dream is a dead dream. It doesn't mean that the God dream is a dead dream. Matthew chapter two. Verses 13 through 23. We've read most of the the other parts of the story. 
It says, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So Joseph got up and he took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt. When he stayed until the death of Herod, where he stayed until the death of Herod, and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, O Egypt, I called my son. I'm just going to stop right there. See, King Herod believes that Jesus is going to take his throne, his earthly throne, because that's the prophecy that's foretold in Isaiah. They're dead set that Jesus has to rule the government from an earthly throne, that he can't rule the government from a heavenly throne. They miss it. They're not seeing the real Jesus. They're seeing the Jesus that they want to see, the Jesus that they think they should see. They're not seeing the real Jesus. And so Herod says in this moment, the Magi outsmart him, as we talked about last week. They all show up at King Herod, say, hey, where's the child? They move on. King Herod says, hey, tell me where he is once you meet with him. King Herod missed the moment to go and worship Jesus. The Magi outsmart him. They never return. And so King Herod says, well, I don't know where Jesus actually is, so let's just kill all of the baby boys. And then no one can take my throne. No one can have my spot if we kill all of the baby boys. Looking back at the Christmas story, for us, it's easy to see the hand of God moving, fulfilling his promises to Mary and Joseph. The child was miraculously conceived, heralded by angels and visited by important people. Dreams and visions all confirming the promise. But living in the situation would have been totally different. Living in the situation would have been a nightmare. The first two years of Jesus' life was spent as a refugee, spent in asylum. He had to flee his own country and go to Egypt. Imagine being Joseph and making the decision, knowing that Jesus was going to be murdered if you didn't get him out and into Egypt, and then hearing that King Herod, because you had safely gotten away, is murdering all of these other children. You know, we think, oh man, you know, he was kind of like, he was kind of born into tough circumstances, right? The real Jesus was. He shows up and there's no room in the inn for him. He's, he's born in a feeding trough. He's born to an unwed mother that is young. He's born into a giant scandal. And we think, oh man, it all got easier after that, but it couldn't be further from the truth. Jesus now goes on the run. The real Jesus has to run for his life. He has to leave everything that he knows, he and his family, so that he can make it, so that he can survive. You know that Jesus, the real Jesus, literally wears the badge of illegitimacy his entire life. We see Jesus interact with the Pharisees in the temple later in his life, and they make reference to the fact that they were born of Abraham. What they were saying is not like you. Not like you. We're legitimate. You're not. He wears the pain and the badge of his birth the entirety of his life. He never gets away from it. I remember being a kid, and there was this gift shop that my mother used to frequent. And it was around Christmas time, and they had this Peter Pan sword that would ding whenever you swung it that I wanted so bad I couldn't see straight. And I would ask her for it every day. Every time we drove by this place, which was every day, you going to give me that Peter Pan sword for Christmas? Are you going to get me that Peter? Finally, she just gives up and is like, yes, I will get it for you for Christmas. And we go into this gift shop not long after that, and the Peter Pan sword is not there. And I'm devastated. Mom failed. She let me down. She didn't get the Peter Pan sword, and someone beat her to the punch. She told me she would give it to me. She made me a promise. But she never fulfilled the promise. You can guess how the rest of this goes. I wake up on Christmas Day. And there's a package that looks like it's shaped a lot like a Peter Pan sword. I shake it and it dings. Yeah. <laughs> I open it up. See, the Peter Pan sword wasn't in the store because my mom had already purchased it. She promised me something. I didn't see it anymore, so I didn't believe it was going to be fulfilled. The world's promised a king. The world's promised a prince of peace, a mighty counselor. 
but then they couldn't see him for a while. Oftentimes in our life, God promises us something, and when we lose sight of it, we no longer believe that it's going to come to pass. He makes us a promise, and then this period of time of silence goes. We see it all throughout Scripture. God's really good at that. I'm going to promise you something, and then you are not going to hear from me for a while. I think about the story of Abraham. Abraham's 75, and God promises him a son that he's going to father the nations. You think, man, he's 75. That's a little old to be a dad. He better get with it. God better fulfill that promise quick, right? I bet Abraham's going to have, a, have had that son about nine months later. I'm going to go with nine months, maybe ten. Ten months later, yep, definitely. Abraham's 100. 25 years, Abraham waits for the promise. 25 years, he can't see it. He's not sure that the promise is going to come to pass. He's not sure that it's really going to be there. When God promises you something, there's oftentimes a period of silence that comes before the promise is fulfilled. I never want you to lose sight of what God's promises because all of his promises are yes and amen. It will come to pass. There's zero question about whether or not it will come to pass. You will open a Peter Pan sword on Christmas Day. You can't see it anymore. You're not sure that it's going to be there, but it is there because unto us a child is born. Unto us, all of us, each and every one of us, if we'll see him for who he truly is and if we'll understand that, man, his promises come to pass, even when I lose sight of them, we'll understand it differently. Last point, our bad experiences aren't beyond Jesus' ability to relate. Some of you in the room undoubtedly feel like you were born to imperfect parents. You know Jesus was too. How do you know? Well, number one, Mary and Joseph were human. Number two, you know they actually left him in Jerusalem when he was about 12? And it was a day before they realized he wasn't with them. That's in Luke 2, 41 through 45. You think I'm making it up. They forgot him. So next time one of y'all make fun of me for forgetting Ben somewhere, just know Jesus, his parents did it too. You feel disrespected? Think he can't relate? You know, Jesus was rejected by his own creation. He was plotted against. Yet Jesus made himself of no reputation and took the form of a servant. He chose to let God defend him. And because of that, Scripture says God elevated him to a place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. You experiencing pain? You know, Jesus felt real pain, real discomfort. 2 Corinthians 1 and 5 says, For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. You under intense temptation? Jesus was too. Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11, we see Jesus tempted in three ways. He's tempted with lust of the flesh, with lust of the eyes, and with pride of life. Yet he didn't sin. And here's the great news. We don't have to give in to that temptation either. His perfection, his perfection, not ours. His perfection sets us free. I want to leave you with this thought. Do you know that Jesus sees right through you? We love to face a real problem and exchange it with a hypothetical one. But what if Jesus isn't really real? What if he doesn't really care about this circumstance? What if he doesn't really understand where I am? am today and a fancy word for it's called an epistemological problem an epistemological problem here's what you have to understand the real Jesus sees you knows you understands you loves you because the real Jesus cared enough 
to experience everything you would ever experience just so he could have a relationship with you. I heard a pastor put it like this. His son got into playing video games. And this pastor was a division one basketball player. He said, I'm thinking to myself, son, you gotta get in the driveway. We got scholarships to get. We got a draft to make it through. You're gonna pay dad's bills because preachers don't get rich, contrary to popular belief. He said, I realized in that moment that if I wanted a real relationship with my son, I had to experience what he was experiencing. So I took up video games instead of trying to force him to take up basketball. That's what Jesus did for us. Unto us a child is born. He literally stepped down from heaven to experience this earth so that he could know you. So that he could know me. So that he could feel us, understand us. So that we could feel him and understand him so that we could see the real Jesus. If you'd bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place. If anybody in this room would just say, I don't know real Jesus. I don't have a personal relationship with him, but I want to. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to call you out. We just want to say a simple prayer with you. If you just slip your hand up and say, I want to know Jesus. Let's all say this together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for dying for our sins. We accept you as our Savior. We ask that you cleanse us and make us whole. With every head bowed and eye closed still, if anybody in this room would just say, Jacob, I'm not seeing the real Jesus. I've got some promises in my life and I can't see them anymore. I don't know that they're going to be fulfilled. I've got some situations going on and it doesn't seem like he's really there doesn't seem like he really understands just slip your hand up I just want to pray with you dear heavenly father man we thank you for everything that you are we thank you that all of your promises are always fulfilled and God I ask that every person in this room would see you for who you truly are that they would understand that you see right through us, that in the midst of our circumstances and our disappointments with you and our frustrations with you, that all you ask is that we look up so that we can see you for who you truly are. God, let us know that you understand us, that you sense us, that you see us and that you feel us, that you've walked in our shoes, that you have experienced our circumstances and that you have given us not external peace, but internal peace that you've given us internal salvation, that you've given us internal freedom and internal joy that this world can never take away. I thank you for everything that you are. We give you praise and honor. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, everybody stand up. Listen, I'm excited about 2019. I'm excited about this series. I want you to be inviting people We have a job to do. All we have to do is invite people. It's really not that hard when you think about it. But I want everybody to go home and I want you to think about this. All of this next week. 2019 will be the best year of your life if it's the best year of your life spiritually. 2019 will be the best year of your life if It's the best year of your life spiritually. Amen. Hey, I love you guys. I will see you next week. Invite somebody to be back with you.